Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And we're going to be joined by one of the key men from this season's surprise top 14 tabletoppers cast. So we'll bring him in shortly, but we should set the scene and have a little chat about the final day of the season because things were wide open as we've discussed in recent weeks and it didn't disappoint, did it, Johnny? So were you grafting away or were you with a beer on the couch? Packet of beers, mate. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely delighted. Um, it was great as well, because for us, well, for me anyway, I follow a bit of Pro Day do as well, obviously, and my old team was in that final as well. So the day started off perfectly on Sunday with Bayon making it back um, into the top 14, which is awesome for my former teammates, for the club, for everyone around this part of the world that wants to see that team back. Um, and so watched it in the pub with a few of the Bayon boys. We didn't make the the trip down to Montpellier to, to follow and watch properly, but we managed to sink quite a few beers and celebrate as you would. Um, but I think that just highlights why relegation and promotion is so important. A lot of other leagues don't have it, but the drama just around that one game before the top 14 kicked off um, was incredible. You know, a team that had beaten them twice during the season, um, Stade Montois uh, had beaten them twice already in the regular season and to go and absolutely smash them in the final was incredible. So it was amazing celebrations. Then last night was the presentation on the at the Marie on the balcony. There was something like 50, 60, 70,000 people came out to watch the Pro de Deux champions receive that trophy on the balcony. So it just shows how much it means to little communities like Bayonne, which is like 40,000 people, but you've got all the villages around, everyone in white and blue coming down to support and show support. Um, so that was the first one there were maybe six to 10 beers deep. I don't know how many, but that was great watching that live. And then we kicked off the top 14, which again, the drama of, again, it's really well presented in France. The TV production is you have one like view, you have one game on the television. And then every time a try is scored somewhere, a bell rings and it cuts to that game. So really exciting to follow. Again, we knew there were going to be loads of different big teams that were going to miss out and they brightly did but again the drama and the following of it was just incredible a great great watch and we now know the teams that are through Montpellier all the way through to the semis as our cast as you just mentioned and who's going to be in the barrage you're going to have Toulouse against La Rochelle which is a big crunch match Um, and you're also going to have Bordeaux against Racing so we know where all the teams finished um, but it was high drama the different permeations we had no idea where they were going to finish but some incredible games of rugby and big watches and it didn't disappoint for our last final round of the top 14. We chatted about it quite a lot last week given their various roles in the European finals but it was a funny old game between La Rochelle <laughs> and Leon because Leon were 19-5 up at half time, La Rochelle won it in the end with Toby Arnold for Leon dropping the ball over the line at the death with the clock in the red. I guess even if he'd have scored it, it wouldn't have changed who made the playoffs but it would have changed who played who etc. Yeah, exactly. So he wasn't to know, and he looked absolutely crestfallen when he didn't make over the line. And you would be, because look, he's a legend. He's been there for so long. He's been superb for Leon for the best part of a decade. And again, it didn't make a difference in the end, but they wanted to finish with a statement finish at home. Um, and, and again, it was potentially just a step too far. You saw when La Rochelle turned the screw and they un- unloaded their bench, you know, Skelton coming on, Antonio, that physicality, that domination of the game line, we've seen them absolutely obliterate Leinster towards the end as well. That's exactly what they did to Leon um, in Leon. So, but as you mentioned, the, the big difference is the makeup. And if La Rocha had lost that game, ironically, they'd have dodged to lose and they'd end up away to Bordeaux where recently they'd have a lot of joy. Um, but the big difference again was the look on the faces of the coaches at the end of the game, like Pierre Mignoni, absolutely perplexed, disbelief. And then <laughs> the camera pans to Ron O'Gara, like a naughty school child who's just gotten away with murder and knows he's gotten out of jail. So, Again, you could argue that La Rochelle would have taken a loss if it meant they'd gone to Bordeaux. But ultimately now, you've got the two going at it that were top 14 finalists last year, that were European finalists last year, in the quarterfinals or the barrage in the top 14. So that will be an absolutely huge game of rugby. And poor old Toulon, Johnny, to drag themselves from the bottom of the table just a few months ago to the brink of the playoffs, a European final, and then fall at the final hurdle twice in two weeks. And not only that, they miss out on... Champions Cup rugby for next season because Leon won the Challenge Cup. Oh, look, devastating. Um, Absolutely devastating for Toulon. And they lost their way against Leon in their final um, and then actually dominated large parts of proceedings in Paris. They were ticking away really nicely, um, but just one mistimed aerial contest by Charles Olivon and a yellow card and everything's turned 
on its head. Um, Racing weren't the same side without Finn. They'll be desperate to get him back for the next round if they can. We don't know yet if he is going to be fit. Um, but Toulon, like devastation. This, it would have been the story of the season if they'd made it back to the top six after being 12th, after being slated by their former president, their current president, nobody really knowing the direction, but Frank Azema coming in, steadying a ship, getting players back on form and fit. And then that would have been storybook stuff, but it's not to be... Again, it might be a blessing in disguise, the fact that they get to cut a little bit short. They've got Pierre Mignone coming in. They get to go away on holiday, regroup. They'll have no injuries for the start of next season. Everyone will be fresh, no European competition to worry about. And they just come in with a fresh start, a clean slate with a new coach and fully concentrate on the top 14. But they'll be disappointed. They'll be disheartened because what could have been, it would have been one of the stories of the top 14 in the past couple of decades to have that type of romantada um, over the past three months of rugby. So a real shame for them. And we'll talk about the bottom of the table a bit later on because there was drama there too. But we're going to focus on Cast because they finished top of the table for the first time ever since the top four team became a one-table structure. And I know they've won the title a couple of times from sixth yeah. and fourth, but give us a sense of how much of a shock this is that they've actually finished top given the budget they have, which I think is about 10th in the league, the team they've got on paper... Give us a sense of what an achievement is. It's quite weird. So if you talk to people from the outside, everyone here is a real quiet respect for cast. Like there aren't any superstars. They don't have the biggest budget. They're not thrashing teams. They finished first with a points difference of, I think it's plus 36. You, you know, so it's been tight, but they just find a way to win. They eke these things out. They scrap it. They duke it out. But like the force that I felt in cast when I was there was, things that you can't really capture everywhere else that aren't formulated. There's no script, but team spirit, a togetherness, a, a willingness to, to dig deep and, and pull out these performances that you don't get everywhere. Like Stade Francais would be the exact opposite. People looking at Stade Francais and saying, look, you've got this budget. It's one of the biggest in the top 14. You just got pumped by Breve at home at the weekend. You showed absolutely no heart. And that is where cast always are there. They have a sense of pride, identity around their small town, their culture is fantastic, their working culture. And that has been not dependent on the coaching staff that comes in. That is the players and the town, how they coexist and how they go about their business. Um, and, and look, they've gone about their business without making too much noise, just quietly ticking over, knocking teams, picking up some serious victories on the road as well. But for them to finish first and be champions of the regular season and the first time in a very, very long time, is a huge step for the club, considering their budget, their coaching staff, their lack of superstars. And maybe that's a sign that's not what we need in all of our sides in the top 14. Maybe it is about building something gently, quietly, working together properly in the human aspect of the rugby, which we all love. So again, our guests will tell us more. My time at Cast, I absolutely love for those reasons. Those are the best memories that we made at any club in France. And I'm delighted to see them where they are. Now direct to a semi, that's a big step as well two games away from potential history for them. It would be the third time they've won it in the past 10 years, which for a, a town of that size is absolutely incredible. Well, you mentioned it, Johnny. You know the club very well indeed. And we can have a chat now with a man right on the inside playing a prominent role for Cast this season. We can have a chat with their Australian second row, Tom Staniforth. How are you doing? Yeah, doing good. Thanks, boys. How are you? We're good. And you knew you had a shot at finishing top before the weekend but Montpellier and Bordeaux were above you. They both lost. So were you getting messages on about how each of them were doing and how things were going or how did it work? Oh, for me, not really. Like they were sort of um, speaking French and, and whatnot. And I was sort of just <laughs> trying to catch my breath and, and finish the game. Um, obviously, before the game, we knew it was a possibility. Um, but it was still more of, just, more of just like trying to keep momentum and um, have a good game going into the, you know, the final phases. Um, obviously, it's pretty cool that we're, that we've um, that we've done it. Um, but yeah, it was more just about trying to you know stay strong and have a you know a really good um, good game and feeling really confident um, heading into that next phase and finish the game. And it was sort of a bit hectic because um, other games were obviously later than ours, so we're sort of always on the sideline and watching their phones and going, "What's going on?" Um, but yeah, I thought it was awesome weekend in terms of how they finished the season with everyone playing at the same time and you're sort of watching other results. So I thought it was pretty cool. My it lets the drama unfold. It is a very cool feeling on the last day, but you've obviously earned yourselves a weekend off straight through to the semis. 
it's a big achievement for the club to finish first. Like, did you have a big celebration afterwards as a club, or the boys get together and have a beer, or how did you how did you celebrate it? Yeah, it was it was sort of um, I don't know. Like, we had a, had a few beers, obviously, to you know, job well done. But it was sort of like there's still there's still that step to go. Um, if you know what I mean, like, it was sort of like yeah, finish first, really good for the club, really proud moment of history. But I guess as players and you guys will sort of know that it's sort of like you finish first, but you really want to take that that next step, um, and it's sort of sort of a bit of uh, not awkward, I wouldn't say awkward, but just a bit like come on boys, like you know, two games to go, and you know you you get to the big dance, and um, you know with the quality of the teams in top fourteen, like it's just it's ridiculous. Like every team is is phenomenal, like. You know, you play the 14th team or the first team and you're still absolutely in for it. So, um, you know, pretty happy we've got the week off um, coming up. But, I mean, I'm just blown away by the quality of the comp. You mentioned it there, how good the other teams are. Johnny and I were talking about it. I think Cass budget, I know it's an overall budget, but it might be about the 10th in the league. So to finish above all those other teams that you obviously are talking about, you joined in 2020. You've obviously got a good sense from living there of, what the club is like, the history. Can you give us a sense of how big that achievement is? Oh yeah, the boys and the and the staff and everyone was pumped. Um, obviously, I've only probably been here for about eighteen months, um, and everyone was was pretty excited by it. Um, but the team, like, it's it's pretty cool cast because it's just a team of just like just great dudes. Like it's it's like it's pretty special in terms of. Um, the type of players they have and just these guys that are always willing to help and um, everyone's just sort of buying into each other. Like it sounds a bit cliche, but it, it's it's pretty special in terms of the way they sort of just have just normal players. Like there's no big rock stars or, you know, these, you know, 100 cap um, internationals. It's sort of just like, you know, a bunch of battlers, you know, doing, <laughs> doing their best. Like it's, which makes you really proud to be part of the team and, um, you know, part of it. So the boys were stoked. But as I said before, it's sort of just like, like, you know, come on, boys, like two more two more wins and, you know, and you're there. Mate, it's really weird. That, like we're trying to describe it before, but it's almost like a cast for whatever reason. There's just no ego. And I yeah. don't know why, but nobody in the squad, when, in my time with the boys there that I still know and get on with, there's no ego. And I'm not sure if that's a reflection of the town and the people of the town, because it's like a small, gritty, nuggety town that it brings that out in players. But there is no ego. There are no superstars. It's like the team is the star and the town is the star. They're kind of intertwined. Oh, um, it's incredible. Yeah, just like, just, the, I don't know, like the mentality or, um, yeah, maybe the town. Like, it's just like the, the team is, like the team and the club is is first. And, you know, you sort of, you fit into the way that it, that it, that it happens. And, um, you know, if you don't, then I, I guess you sort of, you see you later. Um, yeah, and weirdly, like you've come in, I guess you probably won't have known that the bloke that came before you, but Rodrigo Capo Ortega, who was my captain at the club, like, but physically, like you're almost carbon copy, um, like absolute beast, the pair of you. So how have you find, again, you won't have known his rep, or, or what you did before, but how have you find, you've mentioned the, the, the team, the people, but have you found it seamless to come in? You're obviously playing an amazing standard rugby, but in terms of slipping in straight away, like you mentioned the quality of the league, the people you come up against every week, the environment, how have you found it generally? Mate, so firstly, like, Capo, awesome dude. So he, he still lives in, in Cast, obviously, and, um, you know, welcomes you to the club and always there to help. Like, like, like all the boys, they're just like so helpful in terms of like settling in. I'll come back to that, but they're just, they're just awesome dudes. But um, yeah, sort of, you know, people have said that about me before about sort of coming into that, that um, like capo sort of style. But, you know, obviously the bloke played 400 games for the club. Like, I don't think you just come in and, and, and do that, um, you know, play like him. I thought, you know, I've got a bit to go to sort of, match his um match his level of, of standard and, and and quality but yeah it's um it's just a just a good good feeling and johnny i can't believe you said they were a carbon copy copy tom has got far better hair than capo he does although capo 
has had some serious mules. He's had some great mullets <laughs> over the years. Yeah. So it was a compliment. Both got fantastic hair, but both freak shows physically. Like you're both big boys. That was all I meant to. Um, yeah, I thought oh. he was a pretty sexy boy. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you'll take I'll it. Take it. <laughs> and obviously we are talking about the achievement and how big it is, but just take us back to pre-season. And obviously everyone is aiming to finish top of the log, but give us a sense of the conversations that were going on at that time. And did you have a target? Did you have a name? Was it just to make the playoffs? Did you think you could finish top? Have you exceeded everyone's expectations? And I think looking back, we had a camp down at um, St. Larry, down there in the, in the mountains, which was, which was pretty cool. Um, and the whole conversation was around, you know, getting to that top six. Like I presume every club is, you know, make the top six and then um, and you sort of go from there. So our whole mentality um, sort of was like, just make top six and then it's it's finals. And then, you know, you win win two or three games and, and you're champs. So, yeah, I guess the conversation was, was that, just make top six. And to do that, you know, you sort of got to win all your home games, pick up a couple, you know, a couple away if you can or a few bonus points and you're sort of there or thereabouts. So obviously top six and um, making home, you know, a real real stronghold, like dominating at home. Um, that was probably it. There was there was no real, you know, got to finish top two or top one. It was sort of just just make the six. <laughs> it's everyone's the same. Yeah. But everyone also has those camps in San Larry where you go off and you drink a car and a beer and you're like, all right, lads, let's finish top six. Like everyone does the same thing. But for you, mate, like personally, it couldn't have gone better. Like arriving fairly recently, like you mentioned, Finishing top of the regular season, you, you said you've got two more games to go. You've got a chip and a chair. Why not? This week, again, you were in the top 14, top three players of the round. Top tackler, This Tim's already mentioned, it's 276 tackles. Like I'm guessing it couldn't have gone much better for you on a personal note either. You must be really enjoying your rugby. Yeah, I'm, I'm really loving France and, and Cast. Um, you know, I, I, I'm pretty lucky that I, I, I fell in a really, you know, good team in terms of like the blokes and the people and the structure. Um, yeah, man, I'm just really enjoying it. Like just really lucky that, you know, I guess it's a fair bit of luck. You just fall into the, the right spot at the, at the right time. And um, yeah, I really enjoy the, the rugby here for sure. Um, a lot more physical and a lot more combative. Um, but yeah, just like, you know, it's pretty funny. I was talking to my, my wife earlier and, uh, when I first come to France, I was absolutely shitting it. Just, <laughs> As we all do. <laughs> just absolutely like petrified of, of, of life in a different country, um, not speaking a lick of French. And I was, uh, there was a little poo trail following me from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> all the way. So, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm pretty happy um, at the moment with how things have you know panned out, having opportunity to play in finals of top 14 um you know couldn't have really asked for much of a better um much of a better start to you know playing in france but i guess a fair bit of luck to do with that i think just landing at a good team and good culture and you know good dudes like the people in our team like the frenchies the, the foreigners like just awesome to help like try and teach the language good guys always willing to like sounds small but like come to your house just to help you like get things ready or order things or you know help getting a phone set up like that's the most basic of things but they're just like always available who's at the heart of that at cast well, i think it's a you know it's a massive squad effort um but for me as as a foreigner who can't speak french it's probably the guys that can speak english um so guys like babs and Baptiste, um, but hey, I can't uh, believe you just said that Babs can speak English. I'm going to give him abuse. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, he's he's awesome. <laughs> and, and obviously, when you're trying to learn French, like you need those guys to to say like, Mate, he's a don't say it like that. <laughs> no, <laughs> or you know those sort of things. But guys like that, and like the other second rowers, like Luik and and Flo, you know, their their help is like invaluable. And you mentioned how nervous you were before you came. So just give us a sense of um, what you knew about Cast before you came and how the move came about. We're in Oz and just going through um, pay cuts and um, just a bit of uncertainty. And I sort of probably knew my time, you know, the goal of playing for Australia was probably 
pretty over. Um, just wasn't really on the cards for me. And just as that sort of happens, um, Pierre Bronken um, reached out and was sort of like, um, hey, mate, like, you know, we're interested in you. Pretty blunt, are you interested or not? Um, and I was like, as a matter of fact, yeah, I am. And then sort of that process uh, rolls out um, as, as a normal negotiation and that sort of stuff happens. Um, and then, yeah, so about, um, you know, sort of September 2020, um, jumped on a plane and, and over I come and, yeah, just I heard cast was, was the community was, was like pretty cool. Like the village and the and the town, like although it was small, I heard um, that it was amazing support and and they just loved rugby and and to be honest, it's it's the absolute truth. Like the fans here and the supporters in the town are just nuts. Like it's unreal. Like couldn't have like I send videos back to my father in Oz and he he can't believe it. <laughs> this is so yeah, but it was just it was it was pretty cool, like the way they sort of um, presented the club and what the club was about. And to be honest, it's sort of the way they spoke about it was a no brainer for me in terms of what they said and, and how they presented. But as you know, plenty of people can talk the talk. Um, but I'm pretty happy to say that cast has sort of walked the walk too. A hundred percent. I was the same. So I went from Montpellier to cast. Yeah. I basically signed it without like seeing the place. I was just like, right, Jen, my missus like that. This is where we're going next. I took her around there on a November. Like we drove from Montpellier to cast. She cried. We got there. She was like, there's, there's nothing here. Like, what are we going to do? There's nothing here. Like, what are we going to do? And then honestly, she cried for about 50 minutes. I was like, come on, Jen, like man up. This is like a great move. Great people. Everyone says it's like the hotbed of rugby. Let's do this. Come on. Honestly, when I told her we had to leave cast, she cried like a baby. Like she bawled her eyes out. That's how much she grew to love the place, to love the town, love the teammates, all the wives and girlfriends, like the group they had, the family atmosphere. It is an incredible club. And like for anyone listening, if you're moving to France, cast isn't on the map. Yeah. Like really, it's such an unknown. It's an unknown because it's not, it's not a big, shiny, fancy club that shouts and screams and does loads of publicity. It just gets about its business quietly. Like it's not a Toulon or a Toulouse or a, it's not full of stars. But if you're coming over... Like cast is the place to go. If you want a calm place to go about your rugby, have a good time with the other families, other players, it's one hundred percent the best experience we had. Like an amazing place to play. Mate, all, like uh, that's what I'm saying. Like it's just it is, like, like I'm from Canberra originally in in um, in Australia, so it's a bit of a like it's a bigger, like way bigger country town, but it's sort of the same sort of atmosphere. Just like you know, you play rugby. Um, have a good time with the boys, like um, the family is like really family orientated. Like, man, I'm home every day for lunch, and it's just like, you know, how good's this? Like, you know, a um, lot of lot of family time, and then like um, after the game, you've got the the areas, the suites for the families, like uh, they're looked after. It's you know, and as a foreigner, like, you know, I'm, my wife came here in the middle of COVID, and that was <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> um, but since, since that's ended, you know, it's just, um, you know, they always make sure she's okay and um, check if we need help. If there was one club that would make that effort and go the extra mile, it's cast 100%. Like you mentioned Pierre Henry, who, who brought you over. Like, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the coaching staff. Like, I'd imagine you'll be teacher's pet with Joe Worsley, defense coach, because <laughs> you're obviously leading all the stats charts. So he'll be, you'll be front of class, front and center with your hand up. I can see it. <laughs> but we know a little bit less about Pierre-Henri Bronken. We know a little bit less about my mates. So guys that I played with like Karen Aviongi, Cuts, who's your yes. scrum coach, and Kaba, Yannick Caballera was like in the back row with me. Can you give us a little insight into the dynamic of the personalities, the responsibilities and what they're like as a team as well? Yeah, mate, they're, they're really good. Like it's, 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 pretty well-oiled machine to be honest um so Pierre is obviously the the head coach and he sort of um you know sort of sits above it all and and sort of um I don't know manages and and chimes in and 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 communicates when he needs to um and he's really uh you know switched on in terms of what he wants how he wants it to work players mentality um you know, big, big fan. 
Um, and then uh, David, he's, he's, he's the attack and the backs coach. So he, he rules the roost there and, um, and not much gets past him. He's, he's pretty on the ball. Um, if he's not on the golf course. <laughs> very specific. Oh, pretty cool dude too, you know. For, for 51, he's, <laughs> he's, a, he's a good looking rooster. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so he runs the attack. Um, Joe Horsley's um, in charge of defence and um, he, he's really good as a, as a fresh foreigner with translating and making sure, um, you know, boys have got the message. Um, you know, obviously, as your French gets better, you can, you can understand more. But those first few months, you know, you, you need someone to help. Um, so he's really good. And then Cuds is the, the scrum coach. And he's, he's awesome. He's, he's blunt and he, he tells it how it is, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, and obviously, he's, he speaks English as well. And Yannick's the, the line-out um, line coach. So together, they sort of got all the bases covered. Um, not much gets by. Um, got to be on the ball. And um, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool setup. They've all sort of got their areas. And um, yeah, it's obviously, it's, it's, it's working for us at the moment. And I think from what you've both said so far, people will have got a good idea of what Cast is like as a town and as a club. But given what we've said about the budget being quite low down the league, no egos, big stars in other teams, do you guys kind of love being the underdogs and having your backs against the wall? Do you talk about that? Do you embrace it? And then we often hear about the Toulouse way and identities at other clubs. So if you had to kind of sum up the cast way in a few words, how would you do it? Um, first, on terms of the, the budget and, and that sort of stuff, it's like obviously it's it's well publicised um, in the media and, and that stuff. But... I don't really think many blokes really care. Like you're sort of like you're not playing the game thinking, hey, we're we're tenth on the budget sheet. Like you know, we <laughs> we can't do it. It's sort of like you know, we're rugby players and and we want to beat the guys um, across from us. And I think that's a lot to do with with the players they um, they grab and and the sort of personalities that are in the club and the sort of the leaders that are in the club too. Um, in terms of mentality. Mate, it's just a, a working class. Like, just guys that just work. Um, just, yeah, like, nothing nothing flashy or, or special. Um, just guys that want to want to play and want to enjoy it and enjoy each other's company. Like, it's, it's pretty cool. And the, the mix of people, man, like, we've got, you know, an Aussie, Kiwis, Canadians, Uruguayans, Argentinians, French, South Africans. Like there's a bit of everything, so it's you know it's a pretty cool place to to meet people and to you know see different how different rugby is played and different ideas. Um, so I think that's got a bit to do with it as well. And Johnny, we know Pierre Henri Broncon's only been there for a couple of years. Some of the other coaches that you mentioned, the assistant coaches, are steeped in Cass history. They played there. They know everything about the club. But Cass have been doing this for a fairly long time now, and you both mentioned it, the recruitment, the guys that they recruit and the personalities. And we all know if you're a coach or if you're a head of recruitment, that that comes into it, the, the personality of a guy, what he's like off the field. But they must do a fair amount of work on that cast because that's what you're both saying. Yeah, I, th I think it's a certain type of personality, but it's also they never go for the best player. Not, not if that is maybe the wrong thing to say, but they're not going to go and pay over the odds to bring in somebody that's going to cost them an incredible amount of money every week. They'll bring in somebody they think can add a bit to the fabric of the club. And like Tom mentioned, the type of club it is, like it's dogged, it's working class, it's, it's work rate, it's buying into a team. And like we mentioned before, the most important thing in cast is the team. It's never going to be a sprinkling of two or three massive individuals that are going to hike their, their budget up. So the recruitment has been over the years superb. Obviously, they brought me in. They brought Tom in. So they're doing a wonderful <laughs> job. Um, but look, that's, that's Matthias Roland. So Matthias Roland, who used to play sex, second row, um, he'll be the one that's been watching Tom and keeping his eye on him. Um, he was the one that recruited me. Um, he does quietly and discreetly a great job in the background. You've got Marc Ant Antoine Rallier, now the team manager. He was a hooker, played with me as well. Another great boy. Like so They've just got a knack of bringing in people that aren't superstars, aren't pretentious, aren't going to cost the world in terms of money that want to get on, add a bit of something to a very cool club, buy in. I think the family aspect is also huge. Like you'll notice as well, Tom, strangely, everyone there 
has got kids. Like when I, it was like, it was like Joe Takori was leading the charge. It was then Karena was leading the charge um, and organizing everything, but it's super social. And it's like barbecue and beers every weekend with a crash and you just mix in. It's, you know, just, in the water. it's just one big <laughs> massive family. That's it. You say you go to cast and there's not that much to do. So you get on with the rugby and you, and you build your family and that's it. And I think that's part of the beauty of the town as well is that you buy in to be part of this wonderful team of people and you set about creating a family and that makes you feel even more part of it you know your kids are born there you, you oh, grow yeah. up as, as couples and, and you develop and you make these awesome friendships and that's the beauty of cast it's, that's what it brings out it's an amazing little club <laughs> Tom, I, I feel like i feel like we have to ask you about this before we move on have you got kids because if not johnny says there's some on the way how many <laughs> no, we have a little daughter so but she, she was born in cast and yeah just just amazing um like like around that, so my daughter was born. A few of the boys like bring over some food and just like little things, but it's just like no one need like you don't need people to do it, but it's it's nice, you know. They like, bring over food or you know a little little dress or or something like that, and it's you know it makes you feel pretty special, um, you know, just the because you're away from your family back home, it's 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 pretty cool. And in terms of who they signed, the recruitment. We've touched on it already, but is it also a bit about signing people with a point to prove? You mentioned, Tom, you kind of thought that your chances of playing for Australia were kind of up. And so maybe you need a change. You need a new kind of goal to aim for. And who knows, that may come back around. We might touch on that in a minute. But is it about the other guys as well? They sign players who feel like they've got a point to prove. And did you have other offers as well when you went to cast? Um. I don't know if it, uh, maybe like for me for for myself I can't really talk about the other guys maybe I I, I think that it'd be something to do with that like being moved on from another club or coming from somewhere maybe, maybe they're not as wanted um, maybe that's something that that motivates them and you know it's, it's pretty cool which wouldn't surprise me but for me it was just um, right time right right place I think like I was sort of in my head I was sort of ready um for a change and it's just sort of happened that you know pierre sent a message at, at the at the right time and my wife and i were, were were keen and we were just like let's go live in france let's let's go you know see europe and and travel and and play rugby and experience this competition that you know i just heard so much about and um so yeah it just sort of for me it was more a lot of right time right place which is why i speak about that luck of just landing in a in an awesome awesome spot like it's 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 nice great timing mate and also the rugby we talked about personally but the sort of more generally the difference in competition super what you're used to and where you've come from versus the top 14 how have you find the difference generally in the styles and the attrition definitely the physicality for sure like it is physical like this like you, they, these guys are monsters. Like these props, like they're 140 kegs. Like, and some of them can whack. And like, just the the general, like the way the game's played, it's obviously a little bit slower. But like, here it is. Like, these are brick walls. Like <laughs> these guys, they're they're, they're big dudes. Um, but then on on the flip side, like these backs can move too. Like when they get their half chance, like. Look at someone like um, in our team, like Filippo. Like he gets the ball with half a meter. Like he is a steam train. Like, like good luck. Go high, go low. <laughs> and, there's the two, there's, and there's two or three of those on every side as well. It's oh. not like it's a, an anomaly. No. But like every single side in the top 14 has two or three outside backs that could break like freakish. Yeah. And I, I look at the, the top 14, um, obviously, uh, uh, playing in it and seeing the success of the French team in the Six Nations and um, the European Cup and the Challenge Cup. Like, the competition is just, you know, obviously doing very well uh, in terms of the quality and, and stuff like that. But, like, from a personal experience, like, it is it is a tough, tough comp. Like, there is no, no bones about it. It's a long season and... Every every team can play. Like you, there is no easy game or easy week. And with that promotion relegation, like it's just every you know everyone's got something to play for. Um, whereas Super Rugby, like, is definitely definitely faster. Um, 
but I just, uh, you know, it's, it's it's 14 weeks, and it's sort of, it's just not that that grind of a season. Or, in my opinion, I don't think the physicality is the the same. You mentioned the mix of people and the blend of characters that you meet as well. One of the characters that will stick with me for the rest of my life at Cast is Rory Cockett. Um, I wanted to ask you, he's obviously hanging up his boots at the end of the season. Has his statue been built yet in the car park <laughs> at the stadium? And how is everyone looking forward to having him as a coach next season? Because he's a character. Yeah, um, oh, he's definitely he's definitely a character for sure. Um, he doesn't he doesn't mince his words. Um, <laughs> he, you know, he's he's definitely he's definitely direct and 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 says exactly what he thinks. Um, I think it's pretty important that you know that the uh, players can do that. And I think at, at Cast, you know, a lot of players can can say what what they think. And he's obviously you know been here for 11 or 12 seasons or you know one one two titles and and played I think it's 250 odd games or something for the club so you know he's obviously obviously pretty special to the town and to the village um <laughs> the statue yeah I think it's on its way <laughs> I'm not <laughs> too sure but he yeah he's definitely he's definitely unique and um you know he's, he's another guy that sort of you know helps out newcomers and and makes everyone um, you know, feel welcome and, and stuff like that. Um, but he's definitely got that that part to him that's a, a spade to spade, and you know, you're gonna get it whether you like it or not. He's gonna call it. <laughs> is, is he taking you down the abattoir yet? Yeah, we to the to the butcher. Yeah, we yeah. went we went there, and that was a baptism of fire in there, and it's full French in there, and <laughs> now what's going on here? And trying to learn, and it's awesome atmosphere, like awesome little little things you know the big cut the buffs Mate, next yeah. level but the beauty is so like rory's been there for what 11 12 years so like once you get to know rory's like hey come on down and all and like you go in and like in the abattoir it's a big guy which one of the i think it's got like a 40 percent market share of all the meat sold in france like it's absolutely huge and there's one and rory will take you down like hey just cut your own cut the buff like they don't mind like they let you cut everything like slice it and dice it in there with the factory workers but again that is the club like like woven into the fabric of the town, whether that's coffee shops or going to an abattoir, you're welcomed in with open arms. Like it's an amazing experience. Like I wanted to ask you briefly about Rory because there's been a little bit of the past few weeks, like everyone retiring, moving on. We've seen the the farewells that Joe Tacori's had at Toulouse. We saw Morgan Parra, Clermont, and um, Max Medar as well at Toulouse, but, but Rory didn't quite get that. Obviously they chose to go with two other scrum halves and that would have been really difficult for him to digest. Like his family came over, like, how has he been getting on? Like, did he take it okay, or has it been quite difficult for him in the past couple of weeks? Yeah, I think it. Um, you know, obviously for Rory personally, it, it, it would have been tough, like mentally. But in terms of, you know, at, at training and, and stuff like that, you know, he, like the bloke he is, he sort of chin up and, um, you know, didn't really let the let let the blokes sort of um, see it or, you know, be affected by it. Um, but you know, as as a player and, and, and a human, I guess you feel that little bit of um, empathy for him, um, and that little bit of you know, um, you know, he didn't quite get probably um, you know didn't get that last send off. But in terms of you know what we were saying before about about the team and the and the club, um, you know, the the team is sort of you know the coaches make those decisions and it's for the best interests of the team. And, and that's sort of the, the fabric of, of the club and you sort of have to, you know, um, back those decisions and, and, and know that the, the club, comes, club comes first. And Rory, to his credit, you know, accepts that and, and, and moves on. You know, he's him like anyone wants to win. And, you know, at the end of the day, if we win the comp, like it's, it's um, mission accomplished. And, you know, I think, I think it was pretty good by Rory just to, you know, he sort of took it in his stride and, and, and moved on. And by the same token by the club, you know, it wouldn't have been an easy decision um, by any means, but, you know, they sort of, they made that decision and, you know, to their credit, it's, it's panned out. Like, um, you know, you can't ask for, for a better, better ending um, in terms of for the regular season. So, you know, I think that's, that's part and parcel of, of rugby and uh, for me, I, I don't know too many players that that get to pick their last their last um, game. Unfortunately, like it's it is pro it is pro sport, and you know as much as you would have wanted it for him, 
that's just you know lots of players get to that you know it's, it's, it's hard to say but yeah i think it's it's part and parcel Asked it. That's what you should be put down. That's what you're saying. <laughs> Take him to the abattoir. <laughs> Take him to the abattoir. I'm, right. not, I'm not saying that at Take all. Take a little terrier to the abattoir. <laughs> hey, we've got a couple more games left. You never know. Anything could happen. He might play a key role still. 100%. Uh, Tom, for you personally, you mentioned earlier on that before you moved to Cash, you sort of felt like your chances of playing for Australia had gone. That's how, how you sort of felt. You obviously did play for Australia under 20 level. And we've seen other players come to the top 14 and stand out in another competition and thrive and then get international recognition. So I assume your phone is on, you're ready if needed. Has anyone been in touch at all? Because it has been a standout season, this one. So has anyone just mentioned anything? Just put the feelers out there, any messages, any contacts? Nah, nah, mate, to be honest, I think I'm I'm fair way off. Like for me, if if I'm if I'm picking from overseas, you know, you've got Rory Arnold, Will Skelton, like they're for rubbish. Me, <laughs> For me, those two are the those two are the best two locks in um, for Australia. Like if if I'm picking the World Cup team, you know they're in it for sure. Like those two boys, like they just they dominate. Like yeah, I, if I'm Mars Rugby, I, I'm I'm moving heaven and earth to get those boys back. They're just they're, yeah, they're miles in front in in my opinion and. That's that's the way that's the way the cookie crumbles. You know, there's there's better players, and you just got to smile and wave. And, <laughs> and but if they want the if they want the top tackler in the top fourteen as well as them, your phone's on. The phone is on, and also, mate, it's uh, on. If if you get to the get World Cup time, and they're like, right, we've got a squad over, we've lost three second rowers. Who are we going to call? They're like, well, we've got a big fella. We've got Tom just down in cast. He's just down the road. We've got games in Toulouse. Get, get, it's 30 minutes down the road. Get your boots and you're in. Why not? <laughs> so you've got a week off this weekend. I'm not sure what the plan is, whether you get a bit of time off, whether it's full on training. By the sound of cast and how hard you work, you're probably in every day, eight hours a day, grafting away. Um, then it'll be Toulouse or La Rochelle. I'm guessing you're going to say no preference. But I'm going to ask anyway. Any preference? Yeah, no, no preference. Like, I guess, as I was saying before, like I don't know. You, you've got to beat everyone if you want to, you know, if, if you want to get there. Um, so semi-final or final, like you know, it's one of those things. You just waste energy thinking on something that that you really have no control or power over. So for me, I you know, kick back this weekend. Might have a beer or two. Knock back a Corona and just relax and <laughs> enjoy the footy, and then obviously roll into next week. And obviously, then you know who you've got and do all the normal preparation, pre- preview, review, etc. Um, but man, it'll it'll be a that'll be a great game to watch. Lara Shell to lose, Lara Shell with the momentum they have to lose with the with the team they have. Like it'll, that, that'll just be a cracker. Not that Absolutely. I've got preference, but Go if I did, Tim, 100% cast against Toulouse. I think for <laughs> everyone in France as a neutral and then everyone that's in cast and Toulouse that supports those teams that wants to see it in a semi-final, mate, that would be huge. A big local derby in Nice for a semi to get to a final for cast or for Toulouse would be incredible. So for me, not of getting against La Rochelle, but if I was to have my choice as a neutral viewer who will be there watching in the stand talking rubbish about the game, I'd love to see cast against Toulouse. The energy for a round game against Toulouse was, was, was I've never seen anything like it. So I can't imagine what it would be like um, for a semi. Well, whoever it is, you deserve a weekend off and more than two beers. Have three, four, five, oh. and then get back on it the next week. Massive congratulations on finishing top of the table and a big couple of weeks ahead. So good luck, Tom. Thanks, boys. Thanks for having me. All the best, mate. Enjoy those Coronas. <laughs> Interesting that, and a club you know well, and you're both saying exactly the same things. They've obviously got their recruitment bang on, their work ethic bang on, and they're deservedly top of the table. Yeah, and there's a sort of straight, again, you don't get it everywhere in the top 14, but there's a a quietness and a stability around the structures of the club and the people that are there and how you looked after that quite often when you come over, it can be volatile. Like that, That's the truth in that some different clubs, there's a bit of volatility and they're not quite structured properly. And cast absolutely is off the field. They do a tremendous job. Um, and then off the field, not the admin side, but the social side and the looking after of people and the care they take, 
you then get that tenfold in the performances from the team. Um, so look, it was all, it was my favourite club that we that I got to play at by a mile in France. Um, and there's another man absolutely loving it, enjoying his time in France, coming from Oz. As he said, there was a shit trail the whole way from Australia <laughs> to France. But he's settled in and he's killing it. Like he's playing well every single week. Um, and weirdly, like he won't, I know he talked himself down, but he won't be too far away from international recognition. He's playing in the biggest, most physical league in the world. He's doing an outstanding job. Yes, he's got the Arnold boys. He's got big Will Skilton ahead of him as well. But like Dave Rennie and the Australian setup, they aren't daft. Every single league is coded. They keep tabs on every single player, no matter where they are. So they'll see and they'll recognize how well he's doing. So um, a great bloke playing extremely well in a tough league um, and great catch up them well and see he's having a great time in cast because it is an outstanding place to play rugby. So that's the top of the table sorted. At the oh. bottom, Perpignan did what they needed to do and beat Bordeaux at home, which you didn't necessarily see coming. But no. unfortunately for them, Brief went away at Stade Francais, which you did see coming. I mean, did you? So you said it was I more mean, likely, I, I think. I said really. it was a possibility, but like, like you've got... The Perpignan coach Arlet has this week saying like like my players as they have done all year like standing up for their values sticking together digging it out Stade Francais could take a leaf out of our book like Stade Francais have one of the biggest budgets in the top fourteen but they they shipped thirty five odd points at home to breathe like they they didn't even turn up so again maybe people didn't see it coming but I think like the attitude has to be a question of the Stade Francais players like what are you actually there for do you want to finish with a flourish as a group in front of your families, in front of your fans, or are you just there picking up a paycheck? That's what's been leveled at them. Um, and you did uh, see that coming, Johnny, because last week you said if I mean, either I of those it, results, yeah, if because Stade Francais got nothing to play for. But but as well, like Bordeaux, big team coming to Perpignan who haven't been exceptional. The form hasn't been great, but they dug it out. Like that was it. They just rolled their sleeves up and in front of their home fans, Damian Chuli, friend of the show as well, retiring, big send off for him, and they really dug deep. Like the flip of that is that Christoph Urios leveling his players in the post-match press conference. Matthew Jalibert, Cameron Wocky, where are you? Like it's time for you boys to stand up. I mean, like really, really harsh going into them. But it, it could have been called, but I didn't expect the manner. The manner of the defeat for Stade Francais was embarrassing for a club of that stature with the level of player they have and the, and the salaries they pay out to have that product on the field. They'll be really disappointed. Again, they'll want to scratch this season, rebuild, I look forward to next year. Um, but now you have um, Perpignan go to the Accension match, so the playoff match against Mont-Marsan, Stade Mont Montois. But you would think Perpignan, after having played in Pro de Deux two seasons ago with not too much of a change in their team structure and their uh, their player base, should go to Mont-Marsan and win. That being said, nobody's ever won the away game in the Pro de Deux playoff. It's always been the Pro de Deux side with home support, fired up that win it but on paper Perpignan should win that game and should retain their place but again it's not it's a horrible game to be part of you do not want to part of that game one team with everything to gain although Monomarsan with their structures with their setup with the money they have in the club what will they come up to top 14 and do the answer is nothing they won't add too much to their budget at all so it'll be extremely hard Perpignan would be well worth another year with a solid base of players and another year to develop another year in top 14 but We'll see. It's not an easy game to play in. Um, and you can guarantee Monomarsan, after leading Pro de Deux all season, really disappointing in their final. They got absolutely crucified by Bayonne by 40 points. They also have a point of proof. So another huge game coming up this weekend, alongside the barrage, is the Pro de Deux playoff game. And Johnny, poor old Beerits. Oh. Their 87 defeat at Toulouse just about sums up how things have gone for them in the past few months. And when... Big Joe Takori is kicking conversions from the touchline. You really know you're in trouble. How good, though, for Joe Takori. Yeah. I mean, absolutely incredible. But again, like Beeritz released this morning, they got 20 players leaving the club. And it was clear as day. Like they were not looking to organize a shoulder reconstruction this summer. Like boys were not even trying to tackle. It was a shambles. So to lose five point win, they booked their place. Um, but beer, it's, you know, a long, old, hard graft with politics off the field, with nothing going right on the field, with a, you know, a real shallow pool of players to pick from. You had Jean-Baptiste Jean Aldige coming out this weekend saying, look, really the top 14 is ring-fenced. It's rigged. It's impossible for anyone to come up from Pro de Deux. Buy on now. Their neighbours coming up. Signed Maxime Machino, Camille Lopez. Look like they're picking up a couple of second rows from Montpellier, like slowly going about the recruitment. You never know, but it's a hard gig. And Beerits this year, 
for various reasons, yeah, coaching staff, politics off the field, conflicts with the local mayor's office, it has been a disaster. They look forward to the end of the season. They've already signed a plethora of other young players to come in. The youngest, Tau Fufunwa brother, the younger brother of um, Seb Tau has just signed this week as well. So they'll want to start again. They'll start from scratch, go again, rebuild in Prodi Do with a modest budget and see what they can do again. Again, they finished sixth in Prodi Do and came up. Like you just never know. And that's the call from the Prodi Do sides is, can we remodel this? Can we make it that the team that finishes first, that dominates all season, has a bit more foresight and can maybe sign players with a bit more time because now by on, ultimately they've got four weeks for preseason, sign as many players as they can, add that sprinkling quality, a new coaching staff that's coming in as well, but hope that they can string something together, start well at home and endure the marathon that is the top 14 next year. But amazing for Bayon to be back in the top 14. I was going to say, you mentioned it a couple of times, Bayon coming back up to the top 14. You yep. kind of joined in the celebrations a little bit. You were having beers in the pub near you. The celebrations did look amazing. Yeah. On a lighter note, the videos of someone parading the trophy around with just the Bayon mascot's head on. Do you know who that was? Yeah, hundred percent. I recognise that ass <laughs> and those arms. And there's somebody that doesn't mind getting their kit off. Um, his first name is Arthur, and his second name will remain classified. <laughs> um, but an outside back that loves getting naked at every single opportunity after one beer. Um, and that was one hundred percent him. Right. I'm hoping that isn't our meter moment of the week. But it's that no. time. So what have you got for us, Johnny? <laughs> now, you mentioned his name earlier, um, and a few of the send offs that various people have had. But Jota Corey's was absolutely phenomenal. Um, not only clapped off the pitch, a bit of dancing in the middle of the field with Max Medard, but actually stepping up. And we see this a lot. We see people stepping up and taking conversions, you know, last minute of the game, a game that's gone, somebody retiring. But Joe knocked over two. Like, we've <laughs> knocked up one on our social media already, but he knocked it over from the touchline. <laughs> and, I mean, the chance of that happening to a man that doesn't practice his place kicking is one of the biggest, most brutal second rows we've ever seen in pro rugby, knocking that over from the touchline and celebrating his last game in rugby. Um, that is 100% our meter moment of the weekend. Joe to Corey's retiral and the touchline conversion. Well done, big fella. Absolutely legendary. And Johnny, I don't want to claim any sort of foresight or Nostradamus-like ability, but we were chatting in recent weeks about if he'd have been involved in that penalty shootout in Europe, Big Joe would have stepped up. <laughs> and we were like, chance. no chance. <laughs> we were like, absolutely no chance. And he knocked over two. That's it. He knocked over from the touchline, goes off the field, rapturous applause, then comes back onto the field and knocks over another one on 80 minutes. So he's two from two. He's 100%. And we joked about it before. But yeah, he absolutely would have stepped up and knocked over because he's an absolute machine. Legend. There we go. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 11 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can now get 20% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD20 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD20, and you'll get 20% off any full price item at meter.com. Let's have a very quick look at the barrage now, Johnny. Toulouse-La Rochelle and Bordeaux Racing. Who's winning? Oof. Uh, to lose La Rochelle I think La Rochelle go there after Champions Cup victory against Leinster they then knock over Challenge Cup winners Lyon on their patch and they'll be confident um, Toulouse obviously have home advantage but I, I don't think that Toulouse sticking 80 points on Biarritz was the best prep for that type of game so I'm going to go advantage La Rochelle which would be huge for them as well given the context having lost the top 14 final, having lost the Champions Cup final last season to Toulouse, um, that would be another massive step. You saw how much it meant to Ron Nogara and his boys and the town. Um, and so I'm going to give them the edge. I think La Rochelle potentially could knock over Toulouse and Toulouse, which would be a huge game, a huge win for them. And Bordeaux Racing? Oh, I think the important factor is the Finn factor. Um, as a Scot, um, watching Racing at the weekend at home against Toulon, they just look blunt. Um, Gilbert stood in. Again, he's just not the same quality of player. That being said, Bordeaux went to Perpignan. They were they were disappointing as well. And as I mentioned, Durios was scathing with the performance of some of his senior players. He's trying to get a reaction out of them. I think if, if Finn isn't there, I think that Bordeaux almost cruised that game in fourth gear. Um, 
I just don't think with Gilbert at the helm, they will have enough. That being said, if Finn comes back and it becomes much tighter, but I will still give Bordeaux that one. I give them the edge. Um, I think they'll win that and make their way through to the next round. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Tom Staniforth for joining us as well. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can. Check us out on YouTube as well as on Rugby Pass. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, Tim. Bye. Bye. Oh,